Okay, and we're on the air. There we go. Hi, everybody. Hello. All right. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Okay. Hold on a second. <laughs> I can hear myself. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right, so for those of you watching, you can uh, follow the hashtag ThisJS on Twitter if you like. We do have a live chat open if you guys want to do that. Um, I want to go ahead and share my screen and introduce everything that is happening right now. So let me go ahead and do that really quickly. OK. Can you all see my screen? You good over there? Yep. OK, perfect. Awesome. Welcome to this .javascript. Uh, this is the state of JavaScript. We do this event quarterly. This quarter, we are featuring all the different uh, frameworks and libraries in JavaScript. Today, we will be having Ben Lesh from RxJS talk about the state of RxJS. We have Evan Yu, uh, who is the author of Vue, uh, speaking about Vue.js. We have Igor Minar, who leads the Angular team. Speaking about Angular, we have Ricardo Mendez, uh, from the Embercore team speaking about Ember. Um, Sebastian will be speaking about React from the React Core team. James is the Node Technical Steering Committee Director, where he'll be speaking about Node. And then we have a Fred as well who will be speaking about Polymer. So uh, a little bit about why I'm here and why I'm excited about what we do. We have a company called This.media where we try to sort of um, give you guys, give the community a, a better way to sort of consume the exciting things happening in JavaScript. So we do this through this JavaScript and a few other events we have. We do really believe passionately in this idea of diversity and women in tech and um, been having a lot of conversations with the community lately and we are about to launch a new apprentice and mentorship program. So whether you want to mentor, whether you're a company that wants to hire a woman, or whether you are somebody who is looking to get into tech and has gone through a boot camp um, or who's just getting out of college, please feel free to email me. Even if you feel like you shouldn't, you should probably email me because I'd love to help in any way possible. Um, so a little bit more about this .javascript and what we do. We have events every quarter. Again, this one is this .javascript, where everybody will be giving a 10-minute state of their framework or library. This is followed in one month on September 7th with JS Interactive, in which uh, you can basically do an AMA. So watch this .javascript, get excited about things, and then bring all your questions to JS Interactive, and we'll have you know a one and a half, two hour session of just Q&A about exciting things happening. We also have in November um, this .javascript coming and JS Interactive as well. And it's then that we will be featuring the different browser vendors. So that is it. We want to go ahead and get started. Let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen. OK, uh, so first up, we are going to go ahead and have Evan Yu uh, present about Vue.js. So go ahead, Evan. All right. <clears throat> so let me share my screen. Right. Everybody can see it. Hello? Yep, yep, we can see it. OK, cool. OK, so um, uh, hello, everyone. So I'm Evan Yu. I'm the author. And uh, I would now call myself the project lead on Vue.js because now we, we have a core team page. Well, we do have a core team. <laughs> so um, uh, Vue is, um, I'm not sure how Many of you are, but uh, Vue is now a framework, and uh, um, do manage uh, a wider scope of projects rather than just the core alone. Uh, and I think I think we I, I've um, 
done some introduction about the framework itself in the in the last event uh, of this JavaScript. I'm going to skip all of that and just talk about what uh, new things have happened since then, since the last event. So um, first thing, three minor releases since last time. And the first one was 2.2. .2. That was in back in February 26th. Um, all thing that we want to note is um, since 2.2, .2, we started shipping our dist files as ES modules by default. Uh, so if you're using a um, modern bundler tool like Webpack or Rollup, uh, they will be using the, the email by default. So that will help with uh, tree shaking and resulting smaller bundles. Uh, since 2.2, uh, some of the we've spent in the Vue framework has been uh, mostly focused around server-side rendering. Um, so in, in 2.0, we shipped the bundle rendering renderer, which is a uh, renderer that allows you to um, bundle up your app via Webpack um, for both the client and the server. And we'll send uh, we'll bundle to the bundle renderer for uh, server-side rendering. So this comes with uh, a number of benefits, but also had a, a few problems when it first shipped. So in 2.2, uh, we further improved the, the bundle renderer by um, extra. So first, we um, uh, fully supported source maps, and then we uh, started initial core support for Webpack code splitting, which allows you to um, use the same code splitting pattern on both server and client uh, seamlessly. But at this stage, this is largely focused at the router level. Uh, and then we um, supported the page template, which um, opportunity to for further improvements in the future. Um, so this this allows you to specify a template directly to the bundle renderer, which will give you um, which will help you uh, embed assets directly into the resulting HTML that you send back to the client. Uh, lays the um, foundation for automatic critical CSS collection. So uh, when you use our default uh, view loader with single file view components. Components, um, the components that's, that's, that are used during a server-side render uh, will, will be automatically collected and inline into the page. A lot of server-side rendering related improvements. And then improved error handling inside view apps. We um, now catch uh, errors thrown in component lifecycle hooks by default. So these errors no longer crash the app. Uh, you can also uh, decide how to actually uh, gracefully handle them if you want to provide a custom rendering function uh, to display um, that alternative content when, an, when a component runs into an error state, uh, you can do that too. Uh, we also added provide inject, which is a bit mechanism similar to React's context feature, um, which some, uh, provides some of dependency injection. This is mostly intended for library authors. In April we released 2.3, and rendering-related improvements. The the most significant one of them is the client manifest feature. Uh, so be because the bundle renderer takes a bundle that's generated by Webpack uh, during this uh, server-side build, we can also uh, generate a manifest build which contains the build time information of the modules that's contained in the build. So if we pass both the server bundle and the client manifester, the bundle renderer would have both the, uh, the build information of both the server build and the client build. So this allows us to, um, when, when, at runtime, when we're doing the server side render, we can collect the modules that are used during the render and then use the build information extracted earlier to infer the correct chunks that we need uh, that needs to be sent to the client. This is um, pretty. Im this is very important when you use code splitting, uh, Webpack code splitting uh, during server-side rendering because your app would um, send different JavaScript chunks to the client depending on which route you're visiting. So this is um, this is a further optimization to avoid that initial run trip of fetching extra chunks. There's an actual chunk on the client before you can fetch any additional chunks. But uh, with client manifest, we would have we would have inline all the chunks um, 
on the first request. Uh, along with that, we have uh, provided a full server-side rendering guide that details most of the um, common issues that users would run into when they're implementing uh, server-side rendering from, the, from scratch. Um, community framework Nuxt.js uh, have incorporated most of these good, uh, best practices uh, into a more streamlined experience. So if uh, you're interested in something that's uh, easy to get, get up to speed with, uh, you you could probably try Next.js. Um, and then we also shipped some uh, API improvements for async components, um, which allows you to specify a loading and error state. This is largely inspired by uh, React Loadable from the React community. And um, we also shipped some functional component API improvements uh, around uh, a better authoring experience. Uh, in July, we shipped 2.4. Uh, one of the major improvements was the full async component support uh, with, with server-side rendering in core. So this means um, you can now use the exact same uh, code splitting patterns uh, on both client or using server-side rendering. And it no longer has to be uh, restricted to the route level. You can literally use it anywhere you want. So uh, this removes any restrictions on how you want want to use async components or code splitting. Uh, but it doesn't matter if you're using um, using it at a route level or you using server-side rendering. It just works anywhere. Um, and further, performance improvements in server-side rendering as well. So, uh, so we've analyzed some of the reasons that um, a virtual DOM-based server-side rendering solution it, uh, will almost never be as fast as a pure string-based server-side rendering. So um, a lot of view components are authored uh, via templates, and we compile templates into virtual DOMs. So during the server-side rendering build, we can actually skip this uh, intermediate pro representation. We directly compile the templates into uh, string concatenation code uh, and skipping the virtual DOM representation in between. So that would save us a lot of time and uh, results in a lot of um, perf improvements, but in particular when we have a lot of uh, static template content uh, found in components. Um, and some API improvements for easier creation of higher order components. This is uh, one of the areas that, uh, that React has been really good at, and um, in the past we have this pattern commonly used in Vue, but uh, with uh, more users using this in the future, we started to uh, ship some API to make this um, pattern easier to implement in Vue as well. Small thing to mention is in Vue Loader 13, we um, you now uses ES modules for internal mod uh, for the internal modules generated by Vue Loaders to better leverage the scope points and feature in Webpack 3. So with uh, the new module concatenation plugin, this would result in, uh, generally result in much, uh, not much smaller, but um, smaller bundles uh, when, you, when you use the view loader. Uh, so each component comes with, I think, modules. And now each of them can be um, playing ES modules, which results in much less um, scope uh, wasted scopes. In June 21st um, and 20 to 23rd, we hosted the first um, official ViewConf in the world in, in Poland. And it was a great, it was a blast. And we had, um, it was a three-day conference with a uh, one-day workshop to full day of schedules, uh, 17 speakers and 300 plus attendees. And it was tons of fun. Uh, and we're probably going to do it again next year. So um, welcome anyone in the view community to attend. Um, right. we, had a, we had a PWACLI template contributed by the awesome <laughs> Adi Osmani. Thanks, thanks for him. And uh, Adi given a presentation using Vue as a case study at uh, Google I.O. this year um, for PWA. Some of the upcoming uh, and working progress project system, uh, we, we are working on a official ESLint plugin. Uh, this is, in fact, already in beta and um, driven. 
thanks to the awesome contributors. And uh, most importantly, it works directly on single file view components. Uh, it doesn't uh, on not only Only also also checks not all, but template errors as well. It sh actually ships a custom template parser that um, knows about the structure of the uh, of the view templates, and uh, it will t uh, it will detect a lot of common errors and stylistic issues inside view templates as well. Um, another work in progress project is view test utils. This is an official uh, unit test utility uh, for view components. Uh, it is uh, spearheaded by Eddie Yerberg, uh, who is the author of the most popular community unit testing solution, Alvara. Um, and it's uh, it's going to be in beta soon. Uh, Eddie is on vacation right now, but we're planning to official release uh, as soon as possible. And uh, it's going to be accompanied by an official testing guide uh, for Vue as well. So this is uh, currently planned. We're all trying to improve the testing story and around you, and we hope to um, provide the best practices for testing view components uh, and uh, for the community. Uh, editor tooling, we have this. Um, so Vater is a VS Code extension by Octoref. Uh, his name is Pine Pine Wu actually. Uh, Pine gave a talk on Vater at ViewConf this year, and uh, this is this is mind blowing. Mind blowingly good. Uh, it almost turns VS Code into a very, very powerful view IDE with think of syntax highlighting, submits, linting, error checking, formatting, uh, TypeScript hints, uh, auto completion, and even uh, integrated debugging. Uh, there are a lot of more features that's planned by him, and um, probably the uh, the best um, IDE editor extension for view at this moment. Um, and Pine also extracted the underlying editor into a standalone view language server. So this would um, this can be used uh, to support to power any editor uh, that supports the language server protocol, so that we would get the same uh, development experience for view single file components in uh, all mainstream editors. And up upcoming in two point five, this uh, we have. Some better TypeScript integration coming up. This has actually been uh, this is actually has been lying around um, since before ViewCon since June since June. So uh, Daniel from the type uh, worked on this PR that improves the typings of the View core library uh, that enables type inference for the default API. Um, so if, if you don't know, Fuse Default API doesn't use a class-based uh, interface. So um, it's, uh, it uses custom object, which is traditionally pretty hard to do type inference for uh, in type system. But with the improved typings and some of the new features since TS 2.3, um, we're now able to provide the same type inference experience even with the default view API. So you don't have to um, use the extra class-based sugar just to just for the sake of type inference. And combined with Vader, it would be a great IDE like view NTS experience uh, for TypeScript users. And finally, we have some upcoming plans to revamp, to revamp the CLI. So um, we were slowly phasing out uh, Browserify and trying to consolidate it down to one base template that's focused around Webpack. Uh, we want to shift to the configuration as a dependency model, uh, which should result in easier upgrades for uh, existing users. Um, and we want to also support uh, more features via flags, uh, PWA, uh, TypeScript, and server-side rendering uh, should all be available options inside of the default CLI. And finally, we want to clean up some legacy issues that's currently uh, left around uh, in the current CLI templates. Um, and finally, uh, a shameless plug, we have uh, the first View NYC meetup coming up on August 22nd. Uh, I will be there, and there will be uh, also be uh, Posnik is going to be there talking about View and PWA, and there will be um, talks on um, 
Vue CLI and Vue Stor uh, Storybook support for Vue as well. So if you're around in the New York area, please come. And uh, yeah, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much, Evan. That was awesome. Uh, so everybody remember September 7th, we'll be doing another event where it's going to be an AMA sort of panel type thing. So bring all your questions there. You can also find Evan on Twitter. Is it you, you, she? Is that how you say it? Yes. I, I just stuck it on the, um, I just stuck it in chat so you guys can all stalk Evan on Twitter. You're welcome, Evan. <laughs> Next up, we're going to go ahead and have James Snell, who, again, is the Technical Steering uh, Committee Director for Node.js. And James, we'll go ahead and let you take it from here. Oh, fantastic. Thanks, Tracy. Um, all right, let me share here. Hopefully, you're seeing the slides. Uh, going to talk a little bit about what's new in Node Core, um, you know, what we've been uh, adding recently and what fun stuff we're working on uh, uh, right now. Um, got quite a bit going on. Uh, let's talk about releases first though. So Node 8.3 came out yesterday, uh, dropped later uh, later in the afternoon. Uh, the really great thing about this is it includes V8 6.0, um, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about. It's a pretty significant uh, increase uh, uh, version bump. Uh, and the other important thing, uh, 8x will transition to LTS, which is a long-term support plan in October 2017. Not sure the exact date when that'll go, but what that means is 8x will be uh, supported for, for at least 30 months uh, after that. Uh, Node 6.11.2 uh, came out earlier uh, this month. Um, that's still under our LTS plan. That'll be out, uh, supported until April 2018. And then it's upcoming. Things to look forward to. Node 9 uh, in October and Node 10 in April. It's hard to believe we just came out with four uh, in just you know uh, a short period of time. Uh, definitely moving along at a much faster clip than Node has in the past. Uh, so lots of lots of great things happening. So let's, let's talk a little bit about V8.6 and why this is significant. Uh, the most significant thing here is that the turbo fan and ignition tool chain are enabled. Um, the crankshaft optimizer has been removed entirely from 6. Uh, and this is going to have a very significant impact on the performance profile of node applications. And it's something that everyone is going to want to go out and grab uh, 8.3 and begin testing to see uh, um, uh, what, you know, ultimately what the impact is. Uh, it, it could be pretty significant. Uh, six also brings object rest spread properties in, uh, and a number of performance improvements for ES6 uh, features. Um, uh, it's not a, a, a long list of, of new things in, in six, but the, the turbofan ignition by itself is pretty significant. Uh, and let's talk a little bit about why. So um, there was an article written by some colleagues of mine, Matteo uh, Kalina and, and, and David Mark Clements. Um, the the link is here on the uh, on the slide. It talks about the the performance impact of um, uh, of using turbofan. Uh, the slides here are going to be a little bit hard to see, so I'll make sure I post these online, or you can always always go to the article. The the the, uh, the charts are taken from the article itself. But if you look at things like try catch, it used to be that using try catch was a definite performance killer. Uh, you, you know that you know looking at Node 6, for, for instance. Uh, it guaranteed the optimization of code, um, which caused it to run slow. Uh, now it's uh, that story has changed significantly. It no longer deops, uh, and, and you actually want to make sure you're using try catch now, just as a good performance, uh, or as a good coding practice. Other ones are arguments. It used to be that passing the arguments um, uh, special. Uh, was uh, a guaranteed performance killer. So people did all kinds of tricks, you know, copying it into an array or uh, avoiding passing it around and leaking that arguments out. That has now been optimized in 6.0 where it's, a, it's actually the fastest thing to do now. Rather than copying out of arguments, you wanna actually pass those things around. Um, and then we're also seeing some differences with, you know, function size. It used to be that V8 could not optimize any function that was over 600 characters. Uh, so if you added comments within your code, well, then you could just end up killing your 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 application performance, which was not fun. Uh, that restriction's gone away now. Um, your function can be any length, and uh, and V8 will still be able to optimize it. So some very cool things happening there. Uh, 
Um, let's look specifically at the arguments. I wanted to pull this up uh, where people could see this a little bit more. Um, the blue line here, uh, you know, if you look at 5.8 up at the top, that's how things were in 6, right? When you used um, arguments, when you passed it around, it was a definite uh, uh, performance killer. Now look at 6.0 and 6.1, when 6.1 will be coming uh, in, in course soon. Uh, it, it's, you know, it, it, it's many factors faster now, uh, and, you know, than even just copying uh, and you're using the spread operator. It's, it, it's, it's very, very significant impact. You're going to want to do this, uh, uh, you know, to go through your code and make these kinds of changes. Okay. All right, let's talk about uh, some other things. Um, uh, other impacts, you have uh, certain code patterns that, that worked really well in Crankshaft, aren't going to work as well in, um, in TurboFan. Uh, polymorph polymorphic function signatures are an example. It's not uncommon to see functions that accept multiple types. The problem is uh, the optimizer is not able to handle those as well. Uh, so if you are using monomorphic functions, uh, you're going to see a huge performance improvement. Um, uh, over over uh, polymorphic. All of this goes into how the optimizer uh, is working under the uh, uh, under the covers to improve performance. Let's talk about some other things that are going on. Um, NAPI, uh, which is a great one, um, uh, it's a stable ABI for native add-ons that uh, allow you to to compile an add-on once and use it across node versions, even uh, uh, you know across you know node with Chakra Core versus node with V8. Uh, no more you know, once it's all done, no more recompiling add-ons every time you install a node. HTTP2. This is a fun one I get to work on. Um, we've landed the the uh, uh, experimental support for this. It should land soon. Multiple independent DNS resolvers um, uh, encoding standard. Um, Async hooks, uh, node options, util promise supply. These are just a bunch of things that are that, that are being worked on, and we'll kind of go into some of the details on these, and uh, we can go into more detail on, you know, during the AMA uh, in a few weeks. Um, but let's talk about NAPI. Uh, so anyone that's familiar with native add-ons for Node and will be familiar with NAN. Uh, NAN is a set of abstractions, uh, basically you know a lot of macros uh, that sit on top of the Node V8 um, API. Um, the, the the challenge with using NAN is, is, is even though it makes developing uh, these APIs faster, it is not ABI uh, compatible. So every time we update uh, V8 versions, um, you end up having to recompile your code. Uh, the NAPI uh, is a, is a C API that guarantees ABI stability. So even though the uh, V8 APIs may change under the covers, uh, the NAPI will be guaranteed to be stable. Uh, and this can be backed by V8. It can be backed by Chakra Core. Um, you know, we're talking to folks, you know, um, you know other VM uh, implementers that are also looking at implementing support for this. So in theory, in the future, we'll be able to have a, 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 a node add-on that you compile once, and it works on any node on any uh, uh, VM platform. Uh, so it's pretty exciting. Uh, and the API is rather nice. If you're if you're familiar with using NAN, uh, there's a, there's a lot of uh, of improvements to the API here that that make it easier to use. We're still working out a lot of the details though. Um, so talked about some of this. Uh, some about HTTP2. Um, this should look familiar to anyone that's done HTTP uh, in in uh, Node before. There's some slight API differences. We're, we have two levels of the API. One is a core level. One is a uh, compatibility level. The core level really allows you to work with with HTTP2 concepts at a low level. Uh, the compatibility is designed to make it look like uh, HTTP1 as much as possible. Um, uh, the, the entire idea here is to make it just as simple as possible to, to create an HP2 server and client. Here's the client code. It's going to be uh, slightly different than what uh, um, um, you've used in HP1 uh, because of some of the requirements, uh, requirements of the protocol. Uh, this is all experimental right now in core. Uh, uh, it should land um, first, and it's going to land behind a flag, which is the, the dash dash expose dash HTTP2 flag uh, in 840, which should be coming within a couple of weeks. Uh, beyond that, after that, we're going to keep iterating on the implementation, get it faster, get it more reliable, um, and then hopefully bring it out of experimental within the Node 9 timeframe. Uh, then just in time for us to uh, um, make sure that it's really rock solid for Node 10 before 10 goes uh, LTS. 
so lots of exciting work that is happening there. Uh, let's see. So the next thing, uh, we're working on closing the API gap with browsers. This one's really fun. Um, uh, recently implemented the What WG Encoding Standard, which is available. It has been available, available in browsers for a while. It's now available in Node. Uh, went out with 8.3.0. Uh, allows you to use text decoder and text encoder for uh, um, decoding uh, buffers. Uh, there are some limitations. It does require uh, 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 ICU uh, support uh, to be there. We've also made some um, updates to console um, and specifically conformance to the WebWG console standard. The whole idea here is to start making Node act more like the browser uh, and uh, allow code to be written once that will work in both environment. Both environments. So uh, there, there, there's still a pretty good gap there. We're working on, on closing that. Some other things that are being worked on. This is this, this is some pretty cool stuff. Um, continuing work, uh, advancing experimental features, of course, and API, um, HP2 uh, encoding, etc. But we're also working on improved diagnostics, pretty much across the board. Um, Async hooks landed uh, and has been there. It's con we're continuing work on that, adding better promises, support, uh, tracking of async operations, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, uh, Improvements to unhandled promise rejections. It's been uh, a bit of a challenge for a while. Uh, tracing, uh, integration with Chrome's tracing uh, uh, support is there as an experimental feature and is, is continuing to be worked on. Um, uh, the performance timing API, it's new. It's something that's a couple of weeks. It's the same performance timing API that's available in browsers. We're doing things like you know performance mark and performance measure. Um, and then being able to query that timeline. Uh, node reports is another thing we're working on, trying to, you know, uh, on, on hopefully getting into core and into the core distribution soon. Uh, it provides a, a format for um, um, uh, postmortem uh, debugging. Uh, ongoing improvements to the inspector protocol and static error codes are being added to every node error. So um, you'll have this dot code property uh, that you can, you know, where the error, you know, the error message may change, but the code will never change. So it uh, should make uh, understanding what's happening in your applications much more reliable. ES6 modules, uh, <laughs> they really are coming. Uh, it's going to be a while. Um, uh, 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 Bradley Frias has been working on this. Um, uh, for, for quite a long time, we are making progress. There are still many issues that need to be worked out. Uh, there's you know, some design decisions that we're trying to figure out, you know, which is uh, um, try, trying to pick the, 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 the least worse option um, uh, uh, on, on a few items and then you know, figure out what the er developer ergonomics are going to be moving forward on those. We're also working on faster, more frequent V8 updates. So in uh, the move to six, for instance, was the first time we were, we've been able to jump two node or, uh, or two V8 uh, miners and up to a major within a, a single node major. So when we went from eight, uh, it was five eights initially in in um, in node eight, and we went to five nine, then we're, now we're at six. We'll probably be able to go up to six one. Uh, we're looking at being able to make these changes uh, uh, faster and still be able to guarantee ABI, which is, uh, you know, once we get NAPI there and, and it's out of experimental, we'll have a, uh, a much easier time at, at, at moving forward on this. So pretty much all of the ongoing developments uh, focused on improving diagnostics, monitoring, testing, performance, standard support, developer uh, ergonomics. It's not features just for the sake of adding stuff. It's, it's features um, added for the, the, the sake of improving developer experience uh, overall. Um, that's pretty much it. You know, coming up, we have Node Interactive uh, in October uh, 4th and 6th uh, in Vancouver. This is the, the official event for, for the Node Foundation. Uh, as part of that, we're going to have a two-day, I think it's, um, I, think, I can't remember if, it, if it's exactly which day we're having it, but we're having a collaborator summit. So anybody that contributes to CORE or anybody that wants to contribute to CORE can come for two days. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a uh, addition to the conference itself. Uh, you can come, you can talk to the Node Core collaborators, you can sit down, there are working sessions that we're, that we're going to have. Um, uh, it's a fantastic opportunity to get in there and start you know, engaging with the project. Uh, and then Nearform is hosting NodeConf EU um, on November 5th through the 8th in, in Ireland. Uh, it's another fantastic event. At both of those, we are going to have code and learn workshops. And what these are are uh, hands-on 
how to become a contributor to, to core. Uh, the mentors are active core contributors. Um, we did this last year at Node Interactive and we had, I, th I think it was about 200 people in the room, all, you know, and it was in, in a single day, it was the most, the highest number of new pull requests to core we had ever had. Um, which was fun reviewing all those and getting all those landed for the next couple of weeks, but it was it was a fantastic event. So come join us. Um, would love to see you there. Uh, feel free to reach out. Um, uh, I'm J A Snell on Twitter. Uh, uh, reach out uh, anytime um, if you want to talk about any of these uh, exciting things. So that's basically it. Thank you so much, James. Uh, Let's see. So one question is, what are significant features being added to V9 and V10? Uh, so we, we don't have a specific roadmap that is tied to versions. Uh, what we do is we follow a train model, um, which is anything that lands in master by the time we cut 9, that's what, that's what delivers in 9. Uh, same thing with 10. OK, cool. Awesome. We worked on the, the, the goal. Cool. Have to give a shout out. I've been, I've been seeing some pictures being posted on uh, Twitter about different teams actually watching this JavaScript together and eating lunch. Um, I saw one picture of smashing boxes over in Durham, North Carolina. Um, I think they're eating sushi. I saw chopsticks, but then I saw non-sushi related food. I saw somebody with a really cool, um, a really cool. Uh, what are they called? Phone cover, a hot dog phone cover. That was pretty awesome. So, anyways, thanks, guys. And if you do, if you are watching with your team or if you're watching with yourself, we'd love to see a selfie posted, and you can hashtag this that this JS. So, besides that, we can go ahead and get started with our next person, which is Ricardo Mendez from the Ember Core team, and Ricardo will be talking about. Um, Ember. So as he gets started, uh, you can also follow him on Twitter at Locks, L-O-C-K-S, if you have any exciting questions for him. Go ahead, Ricardo. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. OK, great. Uh, let me just share the screen. OK, so today I'll be talking a little bit about the state of Ember JS. First, of all, a little bit about me. As Tracy mentioned, you can find me um, on Twitter and GitHub as Lox. I'm on the core and the learning team of Ember JS. I actually started on the learning team and then worked my way up to core. Uh, it's been a, a fun journey. Uh, and I currently work at TalkDesk. So I'll be talking about Ember and a little bit about Glimmer as well. Uh, like I mentioned, I'm on the learning team, so <laughs> there might be a little bias towards the learning team. And with that said, let's talk about the past and present of Ember.js, what has been happening and what's happening. So first of all, we have a, a newsletter from the learning team. And this is like um, This Week in Rails, if you're familiar. It's a newsletter about the development of Ember itself. So call for contributions, uh, PRs that were merged recently, uh, and that sort of thing. Ember has a, a thing that we call quest issues. Uh, which are issues that detail a big amount of work. And the idea is that by detailing the work that needs to be done, uh, contributors can come in and get informed and have a way uh, into contributing to Ember. So this is a nice way to see what's been going on. Uh, we have uh, collaborations with several people from the other teams like Ember CLI, Ember Data, Ember Fastboot, and also from the community. So one thing from the learning team that we launched recently, we actually announced at Ember Camp, which was in London last month, was the version API docs. 
and this seems like a small thing, but it has been almost uh, a year in the making. It's an Ember app and it's versioned because previously only the guides were versioned, and not the API docs. The goal is to get all of the niceties of PWAs and make it really fast. I, I think it's already plenty fast because we use Fastboot, which is the Ember technology for server-side rendering, but we will improve on that with service workers and etc. So if this seems like an interesting thing that you want to help with, uh, feel free to uh, drop by uh, our Slack group, which is usually the best way to get in contact with us. Uh, another release from the Ember family, Ember Fastboot 1.0 was released on July 19th. Ember Fastboot is the server-side rendering add-on for Ember, like I mentioned. Um, speaking, uh, uh, the blog post details um, more of the technical side, but one interesting thing that happened is that we used to build the Ember app twice, once for the, the regular browser uh, build and once for the server side build. And this was a big push by the Ember Fastboot team and it included uh, a quest issue to upgrade all of the add-ons we got a bunch of the top 100 add-ons moved over to the unified build. Now Ember Fastboot, instead of running Ember Fastboot in the terminal and getting Fastboot like that, you do Ember server and it's a single build and it uses the old server and everything is much nicer. So if you're using this, your CI, build drops by half, which is very nice for testing and deploying. Another improvement was uh, better errors for Ember CLI. Previously, when Broccoli or one of the compilers, in this case, it's the template compiler complaining. That's a nice alliteration. Uh, you used to get just uh, an error page with some text. We're trying to make it both prettier and uh, improve the functionality. The stack trace ex actually expands and shows you much more interesting information. And you also have some environments. You will probably have links to report bugs and that sort of thing. This is merely the first step of many to have better interactive error reporting. Uh, another interesting thing is uh, there were a couple of TypeScript plugins for Ember because despite some parts of the Ember internals being written in TypeScript, it's, or it was a bit tricky to use it in Ember. Uh, some, a bunch of people got together created a typed Ember organization and released the Ember CLI TypeScript. It works for apps and add-ons. There are some uh, rough edges, but we deem that it works well enough for a 1.0. And a related project of this uh, organization, the typed Ember organization, is, uh, oops, the, never mind the URL, it's a, a bug with my presentation, but the, um, typing your Ember. This is a series of blog posts by Chris Craigshow. Uh, you might know him for, also from uh, New Rest Station, the podcast, uh, and it helps you figure out how to best utilize TypeScript in Ember. And related to this, a bunch of people have been improving the types for Ember itself for the definitely typed repository. Um, another cool thing um, is the VS code pack. So I've been mostly talking about um, 
things around Ember, uh, uh, but I'll, I'll mention that a bit more later. The VAS code pack is uh, so an extension pack of several extensions. There's um, the usual ones like snippets. There's one for Ember CLI with the command. So you can run the server, you can run the generators, which Ember CLI comes with by default. And an in interesting feature that uh, Evan also mentioned in his presentation is a language server. Uh, Ember has a language server. Uh, it already has some features, which are on, on the right. Um, and just the simple fact that if you command click on a component uh, declaration on the template, it, it sends you to the JavaScript file of that component. That's already very useful. We can see the little animation of the autocomplete running. Okay. Moving on. There have been a couple of RFCs merged. Uh, to briefly explain what R an RFC is, it means requests for comments, because the way that Ember development is done is we try to be as open as possible to the community and to community involvement. So if you want a new feature to Ember, you can propose it. You go to github.com slash emberjs slash RFCs, there are a couple of templates. There's a template for deprecation RFCs, and there's a template for new features. You fill it out, and then you submit a PR, and the community uh, discusses the, the RFC, uh, your proposal, uh, things you might have missed, um, with the idea that if the proposal is then uh, accepted by by the core team because there's a there's also a period of final comment period which is a, a week that can be extended uh, if there are concerns but after a week of FCP then this gets merged and eventually it gets available as a feature number itself so this one is named blocks. It's a feature that a lot of people want, and you'll be able to pass multiple blocks into a component because at the moment you can only pass one or two if you use the else syntax. Uh, another interesting one that or for current Ember developers uh, is the Simplify Q unit testing API one, which it's basically what it says. So you have the before, you have the after, you'll be able to use async await and all sorts of goodiness. And the API is smaller. So upcoming things. We have Ember 2.15, which is gonna actually be released uh, next week. On the Ember side, we have um, some smaller um, news like removing explicit names for initializers because we use the, n the file name as the name of the initializer. So that's fewer characters for you to type. And we removed the deprecated lookup factory. It's a private API. So that's why we can remove it after it has been on an LTS release. More interestingly, we updated the Glimmer VM version. This now matches the version that's used by Glimmer JS, the standalone uh, library. It brings a lot of improvements, uh, both in terms of the ahead of time compiling of the templates and the speed of up updating and initial rendering. And the router service will be available. It's the phase one because we're doing it we're not exposing the whole API that was defined in the RFC for the router service. We're exposing just a, a part and then uh, 
adding to it. So because that's we try to follow the stagnation. Uh, sorry, stability without stagnation model of Ember. And on the Ember CLI, another thing that has been very requested is being able to app import assets from node modules. And we have fixed some problems with node 8 because node 8 uh, was released recently and had some important changes. And also headless Chrome to replace Phantom JS, which has been deprecated. On Ember 2.16, uh, which will be beta next week and released six weeks after that, we will have something very interesting personally, which is the new modules API. At the moment, you do the imports like on the left side of the, the example. You have to do ember.component.extend and we're hoping to land into dot 16 the syntax on the right we will use scoped packages basically similar to angular and the idea is to break down the the framework and eventually be able to just import the pieces you want in a progressive manner uh, another thing that's being currently worked on is the module unification it's oops the the image is the image is wrong i apologize the module unification is a unified layout for apps because at the moment apps use slash app and add-ons use slash add-ons and this brings some improvements um, because we will be able to do things at build time instead of runtime, like the the routes and the module map mapping between uh, different parts of the Ember. Uh, if you want to keep up to date with this initiative, uh, Matthew Beal from the Ember Card team uh, has a blog post on this, which details the plan and what you can do to help with, and you can reach him on the Ember Slack group. There's a channel specifically for module unification. Uh, another, uh, another RFC that goes with the modules API, if you, if you want to say that, is ES6 classes, because we want to move closer to native JavaScript, uh, because the Ember object model still tricks uh, some people, and it's still a bit complicated, but it's a product from a uh, bygone era when we didn't have anything to work with even before ES5. So the idea is you can use cla the class syntax with a number of objects and vice versa. This isn't merged, but it, we're actively working on it. And then um, if you want to to keep track of all these GC uh, news items. We we're working on a status board because at the moment it's kind of hard knowing where the RFCs and the, all of the features and the feature flags, uh, what's the state of them. So we're gonna put up um, a status board where you can more easily track with high level explanations of the initiatives with links to the to the PRs and issues with the more technical side. So I'll, I'll talk now a little bit about Glimmer.js. Uh, Glimmer.js is a JavaScript component library. In, like Ember, the components have both a JavaScript file and a template file, which allows for very aggressive ahead of time template compilation. We do to, uh, the, the Glimmer architecture, which uh, uses a VM. So we have a Glimmer VM, which runs some opcodes and et cetera. There's, there are some very interesting talks uh, about this from EmberConf and I believe one from EmberCamp. Um, so temp templates are compiled down to a JSON file, which is quicker to parse and load on the browser and very op optimized for initial rendering. 
Uh, then we have it's implemented in TypeScript, which allows for nice integration with VS Code and language server and etc. We have a web component shim. So if you want to use your Glimmer component as a web component, you can just Ember install the shim, change a couple of lines in a file, and you can use the custom element syntax anywhere. And Glimmer was extracted from Ember.js. And the goal is to bring it back into Ember by allowing you to install your way up to a full Ember app. So you have Glimmer components. If you need a router, you do Ember install Ember router or something like that. If you need Ember data, you can do Ember install Ember data. At the moment, this isn't quite there yet, but that's our goal. If you want to play around with Glimmer, you can go to glimmer-playground.netlify.com. Uh, it's like a JS fiddle uh, specifically for Glimmer, and it's very easy to get something going just to see the syntax and etc. Uh, if you go to glimmerjs.com, there are guides and API reference uh, to help you along as well. And that's it for me. Thank you all. Thanks, Ricardo. Awesome. Well, now, uh, next up, we have Igor Menar, who is on the Angular core team. Um, so he'll be giving a state of Angular. Cool. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, let me share my screen quickly. All righty. Am I presenting? All good? Yep, you're all set. Awesome. So thanks, Tracy. Um, my name is Igor. Um, I'm on the Angular team. I'm one of the two tech leads on, on the project. And I prepared a small presentation to just bring you up to date on what we've been up to, what are the new things that we released recently, and, and what we are working on. Um, but before we get there, I just want to state um, what, is, what is our goal? What are we trying to do with Angular? Um, our goal is to provide a solution to developers that allows them to be successful and productive in building applications, whether it's building applications for desktop or mobile. Um, and we want these applications to be applications, the kind of applications that people like to use, which means that um, these applications should be accessible, they should um, be secure, uh, they should be internalized, uh, they should have animations and, and should have really good performance. So, Building applications is already pretty difficult, and we're trying to solve these problems for developers so they can focus on building just the applications, building the features that um, developer that the users want to want to use. Um, if I had to take a, a overview of, of Angular, I would divide it into these four boxes: uh, the core framework, which is the thing that makes Angular work, um, the core APIs uh, that you use to build applications. Tooling, uh, things like language service, uh, build tools, um, the, the tools that support you during the development. And then components, um, because you don't want to start an application just by writing all of the components from scratch. Um, out of the box, the Angular team provides you with material design components and also other tools that help you build reusable components. So we have a very rich ecosystem of um, components based on Bootstrap and many other um, themes and, and uh, widgets that you can use in the application. And lastly, and then very importantly, there's a community, which is uh, the people that bring all of these things together, that make them work, that uh, help you learn how to use uh, all of these things and how to be successful at building the applications. Um, when we released uh, version two of Angular last September, um, we started really focusing on two things, on stability and evolution. Um, stability because as I stated, uh, we think that it's already pretty difficult to build uh, applications. Um, and we don't want to be the thing that makes people nervous or whenever they need to upgrade. Um, so um, we want the, the upgrades of, of Angular to be as smooth, as smooth as possible, but at the same time, evolve the framework so that developers get new features, um, get new possibilities that weren't there before. Um, 
With this, we're trying to de-emphasize releases uh, because it's not really important that there is a new patch release unless you're actually waiting for a particular bug fix. Um, what is important that the, the framework itself is progressing, it's improving, uh, there are bugs that are being fixed. Um, and we want the upgrade pin to be as low as possible. So people don't even need to think about this. With this uh, approach in mind, we decided to have a predictable release schedule with two major releases per year. And these are the times when we want developers to actually know that the release is coming. It's not something to be afraid of, it's just something to plan for because there might be uh, a requirement to upgrade the TypeScript version or make some smaller changes in the application. But our goal is to make these upgrades as smooth as possible. Um, and um, one of the signs that this, this approach is working is that at Google, uh, all of the applications are actually using the head um, of the master branch uh, of Angular on, on GitHub. So this is what all of the Google applications use. And externally, if we, if we scan the internet and look at the, what people are shipping, we see that 75% of all publicly accessible Angular applications are already on the latest master, on the latest major version. So we like this approach because this means that all of the Angular, majority of Angular applications are shipping with all of the improvements, all of the fixes, um, and are taking advantage of all the work we're doing. Uh, the last major milestone we had was in March. Um, we shipped version four uh, with some of the notable um, improvements like 40 to 60 percent reduction in payload size depending on uh, your particular application. We shipped a lot of uh, TypeScript related improvements. Uh, as you probably know, TypeScript is a big part of uh, Angular development. It's tightly integrated. We've had integration with IDEs uh, for a long time now. And um, we really think that TypeScript allows this uh, kind of productivity gains uh, that we are after. We also shipped uh, the first uh, stable version of uh, Angular Universal, which is our server-side rendering solution. Uh, and just recently, I actually heard that uh, Forbes, the major media company in, in the US, shipped um, a major product based on Angular Universal. So it's cool to hear that people are using this in production. Um, and along with version four, we also declared that version four is a long-term support version, which means that we're committing to fixing any kind of critical bugs and security issues until October of 2018. Um, along with version four, we also released the first version of uh, Angular CLI. Uh, this is the CLI that makes it super easy to get started with uh, developing Angular applications. Um, you also get all the best practices and build optimizations. And the last thing is what I'm really excited about is because by abstracting away the build system, we're able to tune and tweak things behind the scenes so that as developers are building their applications and upgrading to new version of CLI, they're getting improvements uh, that otherwise they would have to um, opt into through configuration or would have to uh, do their own performance uh, investigation to figure out how to make things faster. Whereas this uh, CLI approach allows us to do a lot of stuff, a lot of research and implementation behind the scenes, and then release it out through the CLI and applications are just getting smaller and faster. Um, on the feature front, um, earlier this summer, we released a new, um, new features related to Angular animations. Um, animations were already part of V2, but uh, this summer we made, them, we made them much, much more powerful. Uh, with features like reusable animations, so you can build your know, animation just once and then reuse them in multiple components or applications. Um, there are powerful features like staggering, queuing, uh, queuing for um, elements, nested animations, routable animations, uh, animations that integrate with a router and respond to router events, and programmatic animations, animations that you can build up programmatically, you can respond to user events, uh, and you can really achieve very complex orchestration of, of animations uh, using these new APIs. Uh, I dropped a link to the slide so that you can follow up on more features. Um, as we see that um, APIs, data access APIs like uh, GraphQL and Firebase uh, style APIs uh, are becoming more and more important, we still see that most of the, most of the data on the web is accessed through HTTP and REST protocols. And this is why we spend uh, quite a lot of time to make um, accessing HTTP resources much simpler. So we released a new HTTP client 
that has a very ergonomic API. You get a lot of the good stuff out of the box uh, by default, and yet you have type safe API, which means that you can type your responses, you get full type safety um, with a very succinct uh, syntax. We also added a lot of uh, very powerful features like interceptors, which allow you to intercept responses and in, uh, in requests in, in both directions, and uh, progress events. So you can see as uh, the, the request is being sent and also um, good notifications about the, the download progress. Um, with this, uh, we also focused a lot on the payload size of the HTTP client. Uh, this is a theme that has been with Angular for the past many months. We're trying to make things smaller and, and uh, faster. Um, the HTTP client is uh, considerably smaller than other solutions that we had before. The cool thing is that, uh, just like before, um, many of the Angular APIs are observable-based. Uh, this is the same with uh, HTTP client. HTTP is observable-based uh, observable API, which means that you get the full power of observables and operators. So for example, you can easily retry a request. You can do powerful error handling. You can do cancellation. Uh, you can combine uh, multiple observables into, into one. Uh, ben could go <laughs> and talk about this stuff for a long time. But we really believe that observables are a very powerful abstraction for this kind of async uh, APIs, and that, that's why we are exposing uh, it as a first-class citizen in, in APIs. Um, I mentioned uh, components as one of the primary um, parts of Angular. Um, on the Angular team, we build a suite of components called Angular Material. This is a, co a component suite based on the material design theme um, published by, by Google. Uh, and it's a suite that contains uh, all kinds of components, from simple stuff like buttons and panels to very complex uh, widgets uh, like dialogues, overlays, uh, date pickers, and uh, most recently also data tables, so with pagination, infinite scrolling, and stuff like that. Um, these, these components are used by most of the Angular applications at Google. Uh, they're heavily themable, so you don't have to use the theme that is uh, proposed by the, the material design spec, but you can adjust it to your application. And we made it even more customizable by extracting all of the core logic for these components into something we call component development kit. Component development kit is um, bare bones components. Think date picker without much styling, with just very bare bones styling that you can take and build uh, your own component around. So you can wrap uh, the, the bare bones so date picker customize it to whatever you need, but you get all of the logic of, uh, all of the complex logic necessary for, for the picker. Um, and today, all of the material design components are based on the uh, component development kit components. You can learn more about that at uh, Material Angular IO. Um, and what we did, we actually took these material design components and rebuilt Angular IO. We launched uh, this full rewrite in June. Um, we, we used, uh, of course, Angular Material and CLI. Uh, this is the first uh, PWA uh, large production application that the Angular team itself has built. Um, PWA, Progressive Web Applications, uh, is a relatively new way of, of building applications. Um, most recently, we heard that Safari seems to be working on, uh, or WebKit seems to be working on adding support for PWA. So it's super exciting to see. And Angular IO is a way for, for the core Angular team to learn uh, how to build PWAs, uh, what are the best practices for this. And then we're slowly rolling this out into Angular applications through CLI and core framework APIs. We also used the Angular IO heavily for performance experiments. And uh, the cool thing was that as we started looking at the size and, and many different aspects of performance, we found ways to, to, for example, when it comes to size, to reduce the size of the application by, um, I think in the case of Angular IO was 50%. And we are rolling out these improvements through CLI. And it was through um, various advanced um, techniques uh, using Uglyfy and Webpack and code splitting and that kind of stuff. And this is all coming to CLI applications, Angular CLI applications uh, by default. Um, it couldn't be a presentation without mentioning community. Angular IO is one way to, for us to reach community, but we also have a new blog, um, blog at uh, blog.angulario, um, where we, as the core team, but also community members, publish uh, new articles. Um, we try to publish now weekly, so there should be uh, 
quite a lot of uh, cool content uh, on this blog site where you can follow. We have two major events coming up this uh, fall, uh, as well as several small events, Angular Mix in the US and Angular Connect in London. And we're looking forward to meeting a lot of our friends and colleagues and, and contributors at these events where we'll discuss many of the happenings in the Angular community and the Angular um, code base uh, in detail. Um, when it comes to our goals for the future, uh, V5 is the second major release uh, for this year. Um, I don't want to go too much into details of what is going to be in v V5 because we're still landing a lot of stuff right now. Uh, but our focus is primarily on the size improvements, um, hopefully notable size improvements. Um, simplification, we're simplifying several co core concepts, uh, how to build Angle applications, but also how to set up the tooling. Uh, and we are graduating several experimental features into stable. We expect to release candidates uh, quite soon, uh, by the end of this month, uh, and then uh, the final release should be at the end of September. With that, uh, I dropping, I'm leaving here a link to this slide so you can follow up on more details. And I'm looking forward to the Q&A later uh, in a few weeks. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Igor. Everyone can follow Igor on Twitter at Igor Minar. Pretty easy. I-G-O-R-M-I-N-A-R. You tweet so much, Igor. Yeah, I took, I took a summer vacation from Twitter. Uh, it's been That's actually nice. It's yeah, that nice. is really nice. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, next up we have uh, Sebastian from the React core team. And uh, you can follow him at Seb Markvage. Did I say your last name right? Mark? No. no. <laughs> Not at all. Um, so <laughs> that's how I usually say it. I kind of Americanized it since I moved here. The correct pronunciation is Mark Borge. Oh, that's nice. Mark Borge. Oh, I probably butchered that too. I'm sorry. But anyways. See, uh, Dan Abramov told me that's how you pronounce it. And then I got corrected by like two other people. <laughs> well, that's also not how you say Daniel Abramov. See, I, 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 I butcher his name too. I give up. <laughs> you guys can just make up things for my name if you like. That's, that's good. <laughs> All right. So State of React. Very excited about this. Go All right. Well, so the previous couple of months, what we've done is we've launched um, the 1.0 version of Create React App, which is our CLI. Um, as Webpack 2, we're working on new upgrades. We have bundle splitting. We really focused on an improved error experience this app. We started to experiment with some service worker stuff. There's still so much issues. Not everyone can just jump on service worker as it is right now. Um, but we're working that, those out at the same time as we're working on similar experiments for Facebook. Um, we spent some time improving the stability of the React dev tools. We did this primarily because we really needed to have compatibility with uh, React 16. Uh, but one small but impactful feature is that we added a little icon that tells you if you're in development mode or production mode. Um, so this is actually kind of um, created a little bit of a stir on Twitter where some people highlight other apps and, and stuff like that as, as running in development mode. Um, there's a lot of nuances, but whether you're in development mode or production mode, but the key there is that there's a lot of different ways of, of combining and building an app, and we want to make sure that we can do whatever we can to help highlight the different ways and how you can potentially optimize things. Sebastian, I think your screen sharing is off for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to try to share and reshare? Oh, there we go. Keep it like this. Yeah, that works. So we have React up tools. OK, go ahead. Thanks. We also added a theme editor, um, which is kind of a, a, a toy feature, but we kind of think that we had to build that because we wanted to make sure that it was very easy to build whatever features we wanted to the dev tools and make it really easy to contribute. So that's a big um, push for us now. We also got is fiberreadyyet.com to 100% passing unit tests. I don't know if you've seen that, but uh, we've been tracking our development of our, our rewrite React 
on is fiberidiot.com. Um, but so that means we have 100% of unit tests passing, and most of those are from the previous version of React. But we've also refined them a little bit where we have made some intentional breaking changes or we've added more tests as we um, rolled uh, fiber out to 100% of Facebook web and React Native apps. And that led us to release React 16 beta, which is a complete rewrite of React, but its focus um, is on compatibility. So this particular release should have no really breaking changes other than some minor ones we mentioned in our uh, launch post. Uh, new features are things like returning multiple components from render or strings from render, um, error handling. We put a lot of focus on getting the error handling just right for both for development and production environments, just so that you can uh, get the right breakpoint experience, right fallbacks, right error messages if you're uh, working cross origin and all of, of these details because we really think that errors is a natural part of development. So we want to make sure that that's really good. Also, did some focus on file size. Um, we cut the file size down a bit, but primarily we focused on not adding much more, even though we're adding features. Um, and we have done a lot of surveys on what is important in the code base and how much that contributes to file size and what is not. So, so some of them are things that we could potentially remove. We haven't done it yet because we want to focus on, on compatibility first. Uh, but that's something that we can consider in the future to cut it down even more. So for example, we're spending a lot of bytes polyfilling events. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but that a lot of these um, events like mouse enter, leave, focus, in and out aren't, have just been recently added to all browsers. So we're trying to cut those things out. Um, and one way we want to ensure that file size is always consistent is that we now ship React as a flat uh, module, a single module on NPM, uh, which helps with compiler consistency across different bundlers. So we, ha we ship There's so many different ways of shipping React apps today that we want to make sure that across these compiler environments, we can actually um, keep some consistency and ensure that we get all the optimization that we expect when we write our code. So for example, we want to have some inlining if that's available, and then we write our code in a way where we assume that that's available. And going forward, the next few things that we're going to focus on a lot is the adoption path for Async React. Async React is this new way of kind of writing React components. It's not the same as as, for example, just showing a blank space in in that component. It's the ability to uh, do updates and defer and make the whole rendering asynchronous and parallelize the, the, the rendering across different uh, events like I.O., for example. And this can significantly change the programming model for certain things, but we believe that the normal way you write React components doesn't get affected at all. And we show this by running some experiments. Uh, but there are edge cases. Like in life cycles, you can have imperative operations that depend on order um, or particular timing of when they happen. And that could be mean breaking changes. So we're making this an opt-in uh, model where we won't switch everything over immediately. We will kind of allow you to opt in different parts of the application, different subtrees. And we'll also ha build a, the reason we haven't really talked about this much yet is because we want to make sure that we have a good uh, manual for instructing uh, how, what patterns will work and what to look out for, common patterns that, that won't work, that has to be rewritten a little bit to be 100% safe. Um, but that is if you want the really safe upgrade path. You can also go for option two, which is the less safe upgrade path, where Basically, you can opt into subtree. And most of the time, these race conditions that could potentially, in theory, happen never happens. So in applications that are not as, as critical to be 100% bug-free in every situation, um, then you can be a little bit more lenient and upgrade faster. 
so what is async going to give us? Well, we hope for responsiveness. That's one big aspect where we think that uh, certain interactive uh, operations are more important than others, and we can shift those around to be higher priority. Um, but we also think that small units of work, if we can break the application down as small units of work, it's much easier for the application to kind of load balance itself. Um, currently, a lot of optimizations for uh, web apps and UI apps is, is spent manually tweaking things, making sure that you load the right thing at the right time, uh, that one thing doesn't take too much time, what another thing might do. But if we break this down to the smaller units, uh, we, we may not get the optimal experience all the time, but the load balancing will be a, a lot more automatic so we can focus on the edge cases. Um, so one way to, we can do that is by splitting up bundles much, much more fine grain with dynamic imports, more aggressive bundle splitting, lazy components, and so on. Um, another thing that we want to explore is the ability to do the streaming rendering where we can, uh, depending on getting data in at different times from different sources, we can start preparing and, and pre-rendering part of your application before it's fully ready to be shown. And But I think the biggest um, user or developer facing um, impact of this is how you deal with data fetching. Currently, data fetching is kind of lifted out of React and you, you treat that as its own thing and we're kind of unopinionated about it and you have to kind of solve it yourself. And then we have this synchronous path when you render React components. By allowing the whole tree to be asynchronous, we think that data fetching can be much more seamlessly integrated um, across the ecosystem. Another thing we were doing is we're finally focusing more on server rendering. So React came up with this kind of hydration model where we um, server render the application on the server first and then revive it but it's always been a little bit awkward inside of React because we don't actually use it at Facebook. Uh, we use a different model. And we don't even use JavaScript on the server that much. We have a few examples of that, but not that much. So this is more of a focus on, on being serious about doing server rendering, making sure that we, we do it properly, we do it asynchronously, we have integrated data fetching, we do the streaming rendering. Um, and potentially have something like progressive hydration revival and, and taking some of the lessons of how we actually use our servers in Facebook web and our native apps to uh, bring that to the React open source ecosystem as well. Another focus on that is actually a lot of our external contributors are helping us a lot with is, is getting better integration with some of the edge cases in HTML such as what we deal with uh, unknown HTML attributes, how we make that uh, a seamless upgrade path, um, how we can consume custom elements with properties instead of just attributes. Um, should we focus on properties versus attributes and stuff like that? Uh, just a lot of interesting stuff and interesting discussion with other libraries there too. What, what, what's the best practice for doing these things? Uh, we want to do less polyfilling. Um, We've been pretty aggressive about polyfilling uh, up until this point, but since there's some core critical features in browsers that are not implemented across the ecosystem, I think we can get away with uh, doing less of that. And we also get from that a more seamless integration with the native event system. Another interesting project that we're exploring this um, half is kind of the an optimizing compiler system. This is still very early on in our experiments, but React is a little bit unique in that we don't have a separate templating system. Everything is just JavaScript um, with some virtual DOM embedded inside of it. And that comes with some benefits, but it also makes it difficult to build a standalone optimizing compiler. Instead, we're focusing on a, on a full JS optimizing compiler and integrating with existing ones to pr provide better React-specific optimizations, specifically around static knowledge that we can have by how something is written statically. Um, so we have some good experiments already. They're great on benchmarks, but what we really want to target here is real apps. So 
we met, noticed that they're actually not that impactful on real apps. We're not going to focus on some of these. We're uh, testing a lot of different strategies, and we're going to pick the one that is most impactful for real apps. And uh, we're doing all of our uh, performance testing on Facebook.com right now. One thing that we're kind of slowly beginning to think about is, is what does multi-language support look like for React? Because um, what we're seeing with React Native is that you're not really staying 100% in, in React Native apps. You're spending a lot of time with Java and Objective-C, and we have uh, equivalent React libraries on that, that side. And how does this bridging between these environments work? And how, how can we better support that? Um, so we're not forcing you into JavaScript all the time when there's existing code or interrupt opportunities that are outside of the language. Um, we're also get, trying to provide better first-class support for other hooks like uh, the recent language, for example, maybe even more. And then finally, we're really putting an effort on revamping our docs and making them a, a lot better. I don't have much to announce there yet, but uh, we really think that the docs are really important. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Um, so let's see. Uh, will you be posting your slides anywhere? Sure, I can post them. Yay, very cool. Um, awesome. So next up, we have, I don't really want to hear you talk, though, Ben, so I'm not quite sure I should let you go next. But I'm just kidding. Uh <laughs> I, can, I, can last. I can go last. It's fine. No, no, I'm kidding. So uh, Ben is the uh, author and project lead of RxJS5. And uh, I know you have a lot of really exciting things to talk about with RxJS. So I'll let you go ahead and get started. All right. Uh, let me share my screen. And you can follow him on Twitter at Ben Lesh. There's Sebastian. Oh, want to go. Go here. Um, right. Presumably, everybody can see this. Yeah. Yep. Good, Good. to go. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I have a few things to talk about here. Obviously, RxJS isn't quite as involved as as all of these frameworks and their CLI tools and their many many components. Um, but uh, for those of you who don't know uh, what RxJS is, RxJS is um, Kind of like Lodash for events. It's a whole bunch of functions built around a type called observable, which is, for for lack of a better way to describe it to someone who's not familiar, it's a, it's a push-based uh, primitive that you can use somewhat like a promise that can give you multiple values. Um, but that's just the uh, Cliff's Notes version. Um, so what we've got is is this there? It's clicking through. Uh, currently, what we've got is uh, version 5.4.2 was just released. Uh, there might be a 5.4.3 coming up pretty soon, but 5.4.2, 5, the big thing about that is that uh, you can use it with TypeScript 2.4. Uh, we're still building master with TypeScript 2.0. Um, the uh, next version will always be built with TypeScript 2.4, and we're going to try to keep it up to date. Uh, there were a few, um, there's one major problem uh, with the uh, TypeScript code. If you were trying to build um, a bundle directly from the TypeScript files themselves, uh, there, there are some problems with the type signatures in, in uh, subject lift. So uh, we fixed that. Uh, it wasn't a breaking change. So we were able to do a, a patch release. And now you can upgrade to TypeScript 2.4. Um, I'm told that, well, I, I know because I've, I've seen it, that the very latest version of TypeScript introduced some even more strict uh, type checking. And there were a couple of, of other issues that are already merged into master. And the, we might cut uh, 5.4.3, um, which is nice. We should have done 2.1 after that. But 5.4.3 uh, to try to get uh, that out for, for people to use if they want to update to the very latest and greatest in TypeScript uh, ahead of what's coming next. So. T-Rex, for those of you that follow RxJS, every now and then you'll hear someone mention T-Rex. What T-Rex is, is it's this top secret, tiny prototype uh, rewrite of RxJS that I have. Uh, the reason it's not public is I don't want to support it. 
um, people would start using it and they would start filing issues and trying to get PRs and I wouldn't support it because it was meant to be a prototype of what we could do with RxJS to make it uh, smaller and, and faster. So this uh, prototype as it stands contains uh, all of the important operators that I find most commonly in, in RxJS apps plus a few more. Uh, all of the different types of subjects and the multicasting and things like that. And I was able to get it down to about three, a uh, little over 3K gzipped and minified, uh, which is substantial compared to if you were to take the same operators and everything in the current code base, it would be about uh, 20K uh, gzipped and minified, probably more than that actually, maybe like 27. Um, but it's in there. So this, this is actually something that uh, RxJS is actively working towards. So over time, I want to take the existing code base and gracefully migrate it towards what T-Rex was doing. And I'm gonna talk about that uh, coming up. So the next, uh, the next minor release uh, should be in the next few weeks. Um, and there's a few things in here. One of the most important things is what are called lettable operators. And uh, this sounds a little bit like gibberish and I'll explain what uh, lettable operators are for those that aren't familiar. Um, but first, uh, I want to explain like cur the current issues that we have with operators are there's no tree shaking, right? So the problem is that all operators are currently patched onto the prototype, and they're either, they'll either get patched on the prototype by default if you're using you're importing everything from RX, or if you're using the uh, the patch operators where you import RxJS add operator map import RxJS, add operator, filter, and so on. Those modules have side effects that actually update observable prototype to have those operators on them as methods. So the problem with that is libraries like Angular Material or Falcor Router or some of these things will, will actually use those and they'll end up mutating the prototype uh, of observable. And then downstream, some consumer of those libraries will start depending on Angular material or Falcor router or whatever, adding those operators for them. Um, there's there's other problems uh, like people will add operators, they'll stop using them, and then they won't remove where they're adding operators, and Lint won't pick anything like that up. And then a, a final problem, and this is probably the grossest for the internet as a whole, because a lot of people are bundling and using tree shakers like Rollup and and uh, things that are that exist in Webpack right now. Um, right now, you cannot tree shake away unused operators in RxJS because they're all being added to the prototype. So there's no way to just kind of statically analyze and know that you're not using any of them. Uh, you're importing a, an operator and then you're sticking on a pro prototype that looks like usage to most tree shaking. So uh, those are all problems. Um, what, what we... Uh, for the final, actually, the final issue with with operators as they currently stand is if you want to have operators that work in a fluid way. So you say you want to add like custom operator, uh, we'll call it Tracy's operator, and we want to map and then Tracy and then map again and then Tracy again. Like in order to do that, you have to create the Tracy operator and you have to extend observable, and then actually override lift to return a, a, this new Tracy observable or whatever you want to call it. And it's it's non-trivial and it's it's a little confusing for people. So those are all problems that we want to solve, and lettable operators should solve those. So the plan for 5.5 is to uh, add lettable operators, uh, add uh, this, a compose utility function, an observable pipe method, uh, and actually move the let operator uh, to be a method on observable. And we want to have pure modules, and this will come uh, with the, the lettable uh, operators because we, don't, we, won't any, we won't be having the side effect of updating the observable prototype anymore. And since these are all new features, we won't have any breaking changes, which allows us to do the minor release for, for people. Um, so what is a lettable? I've been talking about this for a little bit. A lettable is really just a function that takes an observable and returns an observable. So if I wanted to create this lettable function double here, really it's a, it's a function that takes a source observable, and in this case it's using the map operator uh, inside of its, its function body to return a, an observable that doubles values. So, and then I, I can use it below with um, the let operator. And this, this works currently in, in the current version of RxJS5. Um, 
It's been around for a, a, quite a while, actually. And this is one interesting way to kind of create your own operators, but it's not super ergonomic because you have to use let all the time and you don't have to use that with all the other operators. So that last example was just a, a function that, that just showed you, uh, you know, just a simple function that takes an observable, returns an observable. Uh, if, if you're not into functional programming, you might not think of this right away, but you can use higher order functions to kind of create operators this way. So you could do an end with or this, this map twice, these, these sorts of operators where you actually have a higher order function that takes some value and you can pass it through to the returned function that's a lettable function. So the function that's returned is still a function that takes an observable and returns an observable and you can use it inside of let. And you can see below how we can kind of chain those things together. So uh, just, to, just to go back to it, operators, the normal operators currently look like this, where you, you have observable and you have to add the operators to observable by calling import rxjs add operator and then the operator name. And then you're able to use them below and you've got dot chaining in order to do that. So you just say dot filter, dot map, and dot scan. And the dot chaining is very nice, but as I described before, there's some problems with uh, the uh, operator patching. So if we're going to have these as lettables, this is actually, there's a, there's a PR that I've, I've got in for review to, to do this right now. This is, this is basically what it would look like if you were using let. So you'd be able to import all, any of the operators you need uh, from RCS slash operators, and they just come in as functions. And then those functions can be called, they're higher order functions that will return that lettable function that you can then pass to the let operator. So, it looks very much the same as the previous, but you've just got that extra let call wrapped around it. Um, that's it's not the best, it's not exactly what people want. So we've also got this uh, compose utility that makes things slightly nicer. You can uh, compose what it is, and people that use Ramda might be familiar with this, is it's just a, a function, or it's a function that takes a, a rest of unary functions and returns a unary function that, that executes them all in order. Um, so this is, this is the same, this is the same sort of thing, uh, but we've just got everything into one let and we can make that more ergonomic by actually having a, a pipe method that does that compose let for you. And this is what you'll see. Now the, the pipe method, there's, there's still some potential bike shedding around the name of it. Um, all of these methods are technically pipeable if we were to have a real pipe operator in JavaScript. Uh, which is why I'm kind of leaning on pipe and it's it's sort of terse. Uh, but another another uh, one was just calling it compose was was another suggestion. So but this is kind of what we're we're looking at, at doing. And as you can see, it's not that much different from the dot chaining, but the major example, the major advantage of this is uh, these this can be tree shaken. This can give you lint errors if you don't actually use one of the operators that you're importing. Uh, and also, you're not mutating the prototype anymore, so you're not going to uh, trample or, or create false dependencies in other uh, consumer libraries. So yeah, let up operators. The pros are it's much easier to create custom operators. All you need to do is just create like a higher order function that returns a function that takes an observable and returns an observable, and that's it. You don't need to extend observable or anything like that. Uh, this should be a lot better for tree shaking. Uh, because they're not patching the prototype or mutating the prototype. Uh, the, the libraries like uh, you, libraries that use this will no longer be mutating observable, the observable prototype, prototype and potentially breaking people downstream. Um, it's, it's very, very easy to compose reusable behaviors. Because these are functions, you can compose them as functions. So anybody that's, that's big into functional programming could, could have a field day like kind of building these sorts of things out. Um, and one, one thing that's really important to note is, is these can exist along the current operators we have. This is not a breaking change. Uh, I highly recommend migrating to this uh, as, as soon as you can, but it's not, we're not going to break uh, what you currently have for this. Um, it might even have like a compatibility uh, down, down the road if we ever decide to remove these from the, from the core library. We, we could still easily support compatibility because it's not... Um, it's not a really drastic thing to, to be able to still add these to the prototype. Uh, so the cons here is it's slightly less ergonomic for a single operator scenario. So if you're just mapping, then you have to do a pipe and a map. Um, 
not not the best, but you could also just pass the observables directly to the result of the map function. Um, so, and there's a little bit more boilerplate uh, around nested chains because you might have multiple type calls inside like a switch map or something like that. So the other thing that we want to get out in RxJS uh, 5.5 is ES modules. And this is another important thing for the tree shaking side of things. Um, in, the, in the past, we have blocked at exporting uh, ES modules because the, we, weren't, we weren't really sure what the community was going to settle on, whether it was going to be ESM files or something else. So uh, now it seems that things are, are kind of calming down around that. Um, and we want to be able to get that nice tree shaking. So what, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to actually deploy uh, ESM files in the RxJS pa package. The, they'll be in adjacent directory to the CJS file. So we're not going to break anybody using CJS. Uh, but it'll be uh, pre-configured. So Webpack should be able to just pick those things up and know where to find the, the uh, ESM files or the, those, those ECMAScript modules. So, uh, tree shaking can occur. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Jason Aiden from the Angular team for, for work helping me uh, get that one out. Um, the other note is, according to folks in the Angular team, they, they had an Angular app that they uh, updated to, to use this, this, um, this uh, ES module version of, of RxJS, uh, just, just, just to test it out. And just the uh, boilerplate code that was removed from the Webpack build uh, shaved off about 10K, so that's good. So an, another thing we want to add in 5.5, in, uh, or maybe maybe 5.6, it, it depends, um, are deprecation warnings. Uh, this, is pretty, this is pretty straightforward. What, what we want to be able to do is start warning people about features that we would like to uh, change or remove uh, programmatically in, if they're in development mode or if they're using an unminified uh, global, uh, global version of, of uh, RxJS. So this is, this is just kind of a heads up. It's, it's something you'll start to see if you're, if you're uh, using um, Node in like a development mode or if you're using a development build of uh, ideally in, in CLI tools like Angular or if you're using a development build of um, RxJS global, you should start seeing warnings if you're using uh, things that we want to deprecate. So an example of something like that might be the uh, operator patching, uh, where we would prefer that people move over to the uh, lettable operators. So again, uh, things that we're looking at deprecating would be uh, the, the prototype operators, uh, so trying to get people moved over to those let lettable operators due to the numerous issues they cause. Um, and any operators that are being used in a way that might change, if we can possibly programmatically detect that, uh, we'll, we'll try to warn you uh, in advance. So in the next couple months, I uh, want to start getting some, some betas out for RxJS uh, 6. Uh, RxJS 6, what will be new in, in this, really it's kind of carryover from 5.5. Uh, it, it'll have a reliance on the lettable operators we want to get rid of the, the prototype operators. Um, this, this is something that's, that's uh, worth debating. Uh, it might be that we move them out of the core library, and then we have a support library for backwards compatibility. Um, but uh, there's, there is a change that actually comes from the, R, the, uh, I'm sorry, the observable proposal from the TC39, which is errors will no longer be rethrown if they're unhandled. So currently, if you throw an error in, say, a map, and then you don't handle it all the way down to get to the subscribe, and you still don't handle it there, it actually rethrows the error. And it's a little silly because it causes two problems. One is that if you rethrow the error down there and it's an asynchronous observable, there's literally no way you can catch it. You can't put a try catch around it to do anything with it. So there's no value to it. If it's a synchronous observable, you could put a try catch around it, but I don't know. That's that's kind of Zalgoy. Like, you know, if someone changes the source of it to be asynchronous, it's not going to work anymore. Um, the other the other weird problem with it is if you uh, are multicasting the observable and you rethrow, what happens is that thrown error uh, kind of crawls its way back down the stack to the loop that's notifying everybody you're multicasting to and breaks that loop. 
and then you get kind of what's called like producer interference where some some sibling that was of of a bunch of other things that were multicasting throws an error and actually causes the the other listeners of that multicast to no longer get the values so that's that's not good and it, it's it's i've seen it cause some pretty strange errors that i, I helped debug so uh that's no longer in the spec either so it's just to match the spec we want to get rid of that so what, what we'll do is whenever uh, an error does make it down that far we will we'll report it and we'll um to console and we'll also uh, have it trigger a, a global event of some sort that people can can handle if they care about it Let's see, other things. Uh, there's a lot of bug, fi fixing, bug fixes that might cause breaking changes that are gonna show up in six. Uh, the reason that these bug fixes are moved to a major release is although they're small and they're not gonna be very impactful breaking changes, they still could be breaking changes to people that are relying on buggy behavior. So they're, they've been punted, some of them for quite some time to uh, make it to the next major release. Um, the other thing that we want to do as uh, as version six is is going along is we want to uh, reduce the size of uh, various operators and reduce the size of the library as a whole. So that might mean going through some of the the operators and actually implementing them in terms of certain operators. For example, um, you you have like reduce. Reduce is the same thing as scan take last. So rather than have all of the code that that's there for reduce, which isn't really a hot path, we, we might just implement it in terms of, of scan and take last. And you know, scan is more of a hot path, and so is take last. So it would just reduce the overall size of the library if you're using a lot of these operators. Uh, finally, the, this, this one's, uh, it's been sitting around for a while, and it's, it's time to get it in, which is that observable from will handle async iterators. So async iterators are what you get as the result of an async function star. Um, they're basically an iterator of, of promise values. So getting uh, that sort of interop from, between uh, observable from and vice versa if you're using IXJS, which is built around async iterators, is, is cool and kind of important. So beyond that, RxJS 7, probably sometime in the next six months, um, our, the, the RxJS core team is is not the most heavily staffed group in in this uh, in this talk, but but we'll, we'll try to get it get around the next six months. Uh, we've got a few things coming in that, and the the biggest thing, and I've been talking about this for a while, is a scheduler re refactor. So this might incur some breaking changes around schedulers. Uh, the scheduler refactor is primarily so we can take all of the error handling that is kind of sprinkled throughout all of the um, operators and move it to a centralized place. Uh, this needs to be investigated because with, with uh, the, the changes that was, were talked about earlier to, with TurboFan, um, it might not be as necessary for performance, but there are other benefits to it. So if all of the, if all of the uh, error handling that's happening throughout RxJS is moved to a centralized place uh, with something that can be kind of dependency injected like a scheduler, then that means that uh, you could provide a scheduler for all the people that are using RxJS in Node that no longer does the try catching. So in Node, a lot of people that are running Node processes really want to be able to have that immediate, just if, some, if an error is thrown, just have it immediately die and just, just kill the process. And if you try catch that at all, then you lose some of the context that they want for their core dumps and that sort of thing. So, if we're if we're able to move all of the error handling to one centralized place, that makes life e easier for that. It'll make life easier for things like zones JS and that sort of thing. So, and then overall, this this would be the point at which we've kind of gotten as close to that T Rex prototype that I put together as possible. So, last but not least, docs. The, this is the number one complaint that people have about RxJS. It's my number one complaint about it too. But again, we're we're not exactly uh, highly staffed group. Um, do, the docs are a, a sore point with RxJS. It's very, very hard for some people to find what they need in the docs. We need better examples. We need, uh, we need better documentation. The documentation that's there, the people who have contributed have done a fantastic job. There's some really great stuff there. Uh, but sometimes it's hard to search. Sometimes it's hard to find examples that people can relate to. And we need, we need to do better. So we have a new, renewed doc, docs effort, which is actually being led by Tracy. So 
Tracy, you can find her at Lady Elite. She's taking charge of this effort, and uh, you want to. I'd really appreciate it if you're if you're interested in contributing to RxJS uh, at all. The docs side of it needs so much contribution. Please reach out to to Tracy and see how you can help. Uh, the current plan, uh, as it stands, is to kind of take what we have and port it over to an Angular app that somehow leverages TypeScript information to uh, to build the doc. So I got a nice information. Informate Twain, that's a good typo, um, to, to, to actually build the docs from that. Uh, current, the current process is doing something kind of wonky where we're building TypeScript down to ES6, and then we're using ES doc to generate our docs, which means that our docs link to like ephemeral ES6 files that don't really exist. So it's not what we want. Ideally, we'd be able to link it directly to like lines in GitHub or something. So we need volunteers. Please contact Tracy. That's a big, big deal. So recap, uh, lettable operators in 5.5 5 is it's probably the, the singular biggest thing. Uh, trying to get better tree shaking, uh, smaller library go goals. So RxJS 5 is about making everything faster than it was in version 4, and that was a success. But now we need to get it uh, to be a lot smaller. So it's it's kind of a no-brainer if, oh, do I want to include this or not? Is it, is it heavy? The answer should be no, it's not heavy. Um, just trying to get it lighter. And then, of course, the renewed docs effort uh, led by Tracy. So please, please, please contact Tracy if you want to volunteer for that at all. Thank you for That's blowing it. up my email. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ben, yep. very much. Um, yeah, I am excited about the new ArcsJS. And the docs, which we named docs, 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 doc, goose, right? In the next React yes. uh, event, though, that we're doing, whenever we do the next React event, we're going to play a game called Duck, Duck, Redux. <laughs> it's a pretty good idea, right? Yeah, it's good. I um, like that. Redux. Yeah. So anyways, um, last but not least, very, very excited about uh, the really cool things the Polymer team has been working on. Uh, Fred, who is on the Polymer team, is going to give us an update on Polymer. And you guys are doing your Polymer Summit soon, correct? We are, yeah. I will definitely mention that in a little oh bit. Oh, my gosh. Um, so it's exciting. in Denmark this year. So very excited. Very cool. And I will post your Twitter handle um, in the chat and we'll let you get started. Great. Great. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining in. Um, as Tracy said, my name is Fred. I'm an engineer on the Polymer team. And today, I'm going to talk about Polymer. So let me get my slides. If anything breaks, just yell at me, and I will fix it. But uh, yeah, we're going to talk about Polymer and what's new. And I actually love getting to talk about Polymer, because it also means I get to talk about web components and web standards and the web platform. And if your eyes are already glazing over because it's the last talk and this all sounds super boring, I promise you it won't be. Because the work being done on the web platform today affects what is possible in every web framework, on every browser, and for every web developer. So even if you don't use Polymer, I think you're going to find this talk interesting. So first, what is Polymer? If you don't know, Polymer is a JavaScript library that helps you create custom, reusable HTML elements and use them to build performant, maintainable apps. And so those custom elements are called web components. You might have heard of them before. And Polymer is all about making web components super easy to create and work with. So web components are a set of web platform APIs to allow you to create new HTML tags for the web. Because it's 2017, and we're still using the same set of basic elements that were originally meant to display web documents in the 90s. So things like header and numbered list and paragraph we're now using to create app headers and sidebars and responsive menus and these super powerful web apps. And so we have to deal with really complex CSS and JavaScript that can end up leaking across your entire app and conflicting with other CSS and JavaScript that you've written or installed in some other part of your app. And so when you use a library like Bootstrap, for example, you need to worry about conflicts of classes and attributes across your entire app. So web components let you create new tags and new elements that define their own look and feel and behavior. And any HTML and JavaScript and CSS that you use is encapsulated within those components in a way that doesn't bleed out and into your global namespace. 
So this encapsulation of components is a really powerful concept. And as a goal, it actually isn't really unique to web comp components or Polymer. For example, if you're using React, this code probably doesn't look too different from the JSX you're writing. And if you're using Angular, you might have seen a blog post from last week uh, from the team talking about style encapsulation. So thinking this way in components is pretty mainstream at this point. What web components let you do is bring that way of thinking down to the platform so that you don't need to rely on any one framework to do so. This is especially powerful for plugins and third-party libraries and any code that's shared across teams. Because let's say you create your awesome new calendar picker. And you want to share it, and you want to share it with your team, or share it with some other team, or publish it to the web community. Instead of creating a React calendar picker, and an NG calendar picker, and a Vue calendar picker, et cetera, et cetera, you can create a single component that works across all frameworks, and it's powered by the platform. So I mentioned that web components are a set of web platform APIs. You have templates, which let you define HTML and styling that you then copy from to recreate new elements. You have your Shadow DOM, which enables DOM and CSS encapsulation. Custom elements allow you to actually register and use those new tags that you create. And finally, HTML imports is a native loader for the web for loading dependencies, resources on a really granular level. And with those four things together, you can create your own native web components. So these are four platform pieces. And uh, let's, let's take a look at how they're doing. Pretty, pretty transition. Um, in 2016, about a year ago from today, support was, it was getting there, but it was still very much in development. So templates were pretty well supported. Shadow DOM and custom elements were still very much in progress, with Firefox having some experimental support but behind flags. And then towards the end of the last year and into this year, we've actually seen a ton of support and a ton of rallying around these new specs. All major browser vendors have either shipped or are planning to ship Shadow DOM and custom elements. So this is really exciting. Um, HTML imports are still a little bit on hold, a little bit in the, in the discussion phase. But luckily, that's a really easy polyfill. And it doesn't affect the other three parts of making your web components. It affects the loading. So it's a little bit separate um, from the other three. And so I've spent my time so far talking about the state of web components because progress in the web platform is something we really care about. And it's something that deeply affects Polymer. The better support these key platform pieces, or the better supported they are, the less magic we need to do within Polymer, the less polyfills our users need to worry about, and the more we can all do natively on the browser. And so earlier this year at Google I.O., we officially released our latest version of Polymer, Polymer 2.0. And you can check this out now. This version was directly influenced by the support we've seen from browser vendors. It allows us to match our interface to the final agreed upon v1 specs. It allowed us to remove a lot of magic needed to make earlier versions of Polymer work. And this all gave us a faster library and smaller footprint for modern browsers. So here's just a small example, a quick example of a simple Polymer 2.0 element. You see at the top, you define a template, which is where your new elements will draw their, their look and feel from. You define a new JavaScript class for your component that extends Polymer element. And so you, now you no longer need to call any magic Polymer functions. You just extend the Polymer element base class, and you get a native experience along with the additional helpful features from Polymer that you might have come to expect, like data binding and automatic shadow, shadow DOM management and the like. And your web component properties and attributes can still be configured just as easily as before. But even with all these new goodies, the basic goal of Polymer and Polymer 2.0 is still the same. We want to make native web components super easy to create and use. And so I actually have a ton of really cool things to announce about what's next for Polymer and what's next for web components. Some like really cool stuff, but I can't yet because, as Tracy mentioned, in just two weeks, we're having our big Polymer Summit in Copenhagen. Um, so this is a two-day conference all about Polymer, all about web components. Uh, if you're interested, it's a great chance to meet the team, watch some great talks, try out some code labs, hear from different companies and teams about Polymer, web components, and what's coming next. So I know Netflix has a really cool talk this year. Like five different people have come up to me and told me that EA's talk is really amazing. And then Wendy, another Polymer team member, and I will both be up on stage showing off what's next for Polymer. So there are those dates. It's August 22nd to 23rd, about two weeks from today. And if you're in Denmark or Europe 
or you're anywhere else in the world and you just really need a vacation, uh, you should definitely come by and say hi. Um, tickets are still available. The URL at the bottom, summit.polymerproject.org, is where you can go to learn more. And so that's about it. Again, keep on the lookout for new announcements coming in the next two weeks as we get closer to Summit. And uh, I hope this has been interesting. Thank you. Thank you. That was very exciting. Hold on just a second. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, so can you all see my screen? Yes. OK, perfect. So uh, just a reminder that we are going to be doing a follow-up AMA with everybody at JS Interactive on September 7th. So you can go ahead and register at this.cs slash JavaScript. And uh, upcoming in November as well, make sure to mark your calendars because we will be doing a state of all the different browsers and everything. Um, and to mention again, you know, we really do, we're starting this really awesome program to support women in tech and increase diversity uh, in the workplace. So please do email me, tracy at this.co, about our new apprentice and mentor program, whether you're a company that wants to hire women and increase diversity in the workplace, or whether you are an apprentice and need somebody to help you, or whether you're a mentor and would like to uh, help increase uh, the basically level up junior developers in our industry. Uh, thank you again. Uh, slides are going to be posted. They are already posted on uh, Twitter and whatnot. So uh, besides that, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.